Are y'all excited as I am? You need to get there because we're going to be digging into the living legend herself, Joyce Bryant, in today's Hollywood Black History episode. Y'all know I love me some Joyce Bryant. She was just a trailblazer, an icon in so many ways, and it just it sucks that her story has been hidden for so long. So we're going to just uncover um, as much as we can about Joyce's life and career in today's episode. This is going to be a Hollywood Black History deep dive special. So strap in, grab some snacks. I think you guys are going to really enjoy this one. And with that being said, let's get to the video. Joyce Bryant was 14 when she started her singing career in 1942. Within 10 years, she was a real star, a major star. And she was known then as the Black Marilyn Monroe. Joyce was born Ione Emily Bryant on October 14, 1927 in Oakland, California. Her father, Whitfield W. Bryant, worked as a chef for the Southern Pacific Railroad and wasn't home often, while her mother, Dorothy Constance Withers, was a homemaker. Joyce grew up in a strict seven-day Adventist home and was the third of eight children. Musical talent ran in her family with her maternal grandfather being Frank Douglas Withers, a jazz trombonist, and her cousin, Clara Bryant, being a famed jazz trumpeter around the same time as Joyce's career. While Bryant's image is that of a bold and glamorous diva, her early years were actually anything but. Joyce actually grew up as a very quiet child in a strict household with dreams about as far from the stage as one could humanly get. She actually wanted to be a sociology teacher as a child. No simple pleasures like a movie or a dance or, or, or listening to records. Or... Without much for her at home in terms of fun or excitement and affection, Joyce ran away from home to elope with the boy that she had a crush on at 14. However, the marriage was never consummated and she ended up ditching her new husband just as quickly as she found him in Reno. It was ridiculous too. It was a ridiculous age at 14. 14, oh, dear. 14 years 14. old. At 14. Did, well, let me tell I don't know. It's so silly, but I think I wanted to leave home. I wanted to get away from the diapers and all of that. I'm a huge family. And I had this terrific crush on this guy. And How I, old was he? He was much older than I. I shouldn't say much older. 16. But before, no, 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 he wasn't. He was about 20 years old. Right. But uh, I was a pretty well-developed 14-year-old. And um, this is so, a well-developed evening, isn't it? <laughs> I'm you were afraid so. thirteen. You were fourteen. All right, go ahead. And um, and stayed developed. It's, yes, yes. But what happened? So we went to Reno to get married, and left San Francisco and ran to Reno to get married. Now I got married to leave home. I don't know what he got married for, but and we were walking down a street and I saw in the window there was a woman standing with this beautiful negligee on with a little dog a little um, a little play dog right not a real animal he wanted me to have the negligee and I wanted the dog and this is what <laughs> this is silly this is what can I tell you and so because he wouldn't get the dog for me I went to the bus station and came home and that was that. That was, was my that was Not long was after, Joyce would get her start on stage in Los Angeles when she would go down to meet her cousins. The girl stumbled across an amateur singing contest at a local club, and her cousins dared her to enter. And so Joyce did. She went up on stage and sang a rendition of On Top of Old Smokey. And in a 1955 Jet Magazine interview, Joyce recalled, After a while, I found that I was the only one singing. A few minutes later, the club owner offered me $25 to go up on stage, and I took it because I needed the money to get back home. However, that one gig led to Joyce signing a two-week contract with the club for $125 a week, or about $1,900 in today's money. And from there, her immense talent took her across the country, where she landed a $400 weekly gig at La Martinique Nightclub in New York, and a 118-show tour with the Catskill Mountains Hotel. Yeah. Hollywood would come knocking by the mid-40s, and Joyce would make her first appearance as a nightclub singer in the political drama Mr. Ace. These strides saw the young songstress quickly rising through the ranks to superstardom. 
However, the status always remained at least slightly out of reach. For one thing, Joyce was a talent, but she lacked an identity. The little black girl with a big voice was still just an ingenue, and her commitment to singing pop songs rather than blues or jazz like other black singers of her time confused audience members. Once, Joyce recalled being told that millions of white girls were doing what she was doing, and why not sing something she knew, like the blues? For another thing, Joyce's sweet, innocent little girl image set her apart from more sophisticated and mature singers of her era, such as Lena Horne. This would change by the 1950s. During this time, Bryant found herself billed after Josephine Baker, the Josephine Baker, which just speaks to the girl's skill and talent as a singer, but also... Who the hell wants to go up on stage after Josephine Baker? <laughs> Understandably afraid of being upstaged by the iconic superstar, she quickly struck the idea to create a new image for herself on the fly. I knew that I was going to do a performance with this woman in California. And uh, I've heard so much about her and she was, and it's true, she just ripped the audience inside out without out having opened her mouth. So what was she going to do if she performed? And what was I going to do, being on stage with her? So I came up with the idea to paint my hair. And I coated my hair with lanolin. And I used radiator paint. And painted my hair um, silver. And the, uh, it was an extraordinary impact. Drunk with love, my body in. There I was, and the audience just went berserk. And, um, uh, and Josephine said to me to share because she knew. She dyed her hair with silver radiator paint and found a slinky silver gown and matching silver fox fur. And from that night on, the innocent ingenue was transformed into a sensuous sex symbol. This moment would mark Joyce's ascent into superstardom. Not only did she become a sensation overnight, according to Bryant, she said, When I stepped out on stage, I stopped everything. Josephine herself, impressed by Bryant's power play, even remarked to Joyce after her stunt, Touche, darling. That wouldn't be the only change in Bryant's career after her power move. First of all, wait a minute though, can you imagine getting props from Josephine Baker? <laughs> like, you, like, you guys, I would die. <laughs> okay, I would I would have simply just passed away. <laughs> anyway, that wouldn't be the only change in Bryant's career after her iconic power move. In 1952, Bryant became the first black entertainer to perform at the Hotel Algiers Aladdin Room in Miami Beach, Florida. This was a very racist and segregated place, and segregation actually kept her from being able to even enjoy the luxuries of the hotel. She wasn't allowed to spend the night at the hotel or be photographed outside of the Aladdin Room. Before she was set to perform in Miami, the KKK actually burned a cross in the yard of the hotel owners, and Joyce's management, fearful for her safety, suggested that she change the sexy ending of her provocative show, wherein she was supposed to sit on the lap of an audience member and give them a kiss on the cheek or a bite on the ear. Joyce refused. In a now-deleted interview, Joyce explains exactly what happened when she did perform her sexy act as written. According to Joyce, and this is what she said because I remember seeing the interview, I hate to God that it was deleted off of the internet, but this is what she said, y'all. Trust me, I remember. I got you. This is what she said. So, I did this for the first show. When I went out for the second show, I couldn't see any women. And I was thinking, where in the world are all the women? And when I stepped out on stage, there were all the rednecks and the aisles and the front row, hoping to be the next one to get bitten or kissed. The papers the next day pictured Joyce Bryant being gifted a diamond bracelet by a white male dancer with the caption, Are whites becoming more accepting of brown beauties? That same spread also features Eartha Kitt and another white man. And speaking of Eartha Kitt, okay, so let me tell you guys about how I'm so... F I'm trying not to cuss. I'm so freaking mad <laughs> that so many things got deleted off. Like there were so many great pictures and there were interviews that I had that I just did not save because I just assumed they would always be there. I don't know why. 
but there's this really good picture of Eartha Kitt, Joyce, uh, Harry Belafonte, and there's one more woman with them. I want to say she'll, I don't know who it is, honestly. I'm not even going to guess, but I know she's famous. Um, and they're all like, it looks like they're in a club. Maybe they were like before a performance or something because they're all, you know, dressed up. I don't know if maybe they were like partying or what, but they're like all like arm in arm, arms wrapped over each other, and it looks like they're kicking their legs up together and they're laughing. It is the cutest thing y'all and then in the picture Eartha is like hugged up under Harry Belafonte and you can see her like looking up at him with these love struck puppy dog eyes and I'm like she is so look at her with her little crush she is so love struck over this man it is the cutest freaking thing bruh and I so hate that I can't find that picture anymore but y'all just gotta trust me that it's out there if I ever find it I'll try to put it up somewhere maybe on the community page but it is so cute anywho anywho Joyce stayed booked and busy from this point on, appearing in the most upscale venues across a country, including the Copacabana in Manhattan, Coconut Grove in Hollywood, the Apollo Theater in Harlem, and the Chicago Theater in Illinois. Her image was plastered on every prominent black magazine of the day with cover stories and spreads being done on her. And she was one of the few black entertainers to receive a full spread in Life magazine who profiled her in 1953. During this time, Joyce became regarded as the first nationally recognized dark-skinned female sex symbol and was voted top five most beautiful black women in Ebony Magazine right along with Dorothy Dandridge, Lena Horne, and Eartha Kitt, garnering the nicknames the Black Marilyn Monroe, the Bronze Blonde Bombshell, and the Black Venus. Her image was so sexy that many of her songs were banned from radio play. And I'm gonna be honest with y'all, like... Matter of fact, y'all can hear it for yourselves. These songs are quite sexy for the time. I'm like, okay, sis is, sis is giving us, you know, she giving us sex. She giving us sensuality. At around $200,000 a gig, Joyce was also one of the highest paid entertainers of the era. So much so that Dorothy Dandridge actually pulled her aside once before a curtain and asked her how she managed to talk her management into paying her so much. She wanted advice on how to get so much money. She also asked Joyce for advice on her performance anxiety. She said, how do you go up there and make it look so easy? It seems so easy for you. Joyce also reportedly said about Dorothy, she used to just throw up sometimes before performances. She was just so scared. But what Dorothy didn't know was that it actually wasn't easy at all. In fact, Bryant's stage persona was a constant point of contention for her. Her parents were strongly against her singing career with her mother likening it to prostitution and Joyce herself also had reservations about her sexy image. She felt that what she was doing was sinful with her provocative gowns and teasing persona. But the act kept bringing opportunities to her door in the form of movie deals. Joyce was reportedly one of the desired stars up for the role of Carmen Jones, which would later go to Dorothy Dandridge. And just a little side note, you guys, I was thinking about it um, recently. Personally, and no shade to Dorothy, like she's great. That's my girl, birthday buddy, because, you know, we both weren't born on the same day and everything. But I really think that Eartha Kitt would have killed that role she would have bodied you cannot tell me eartha would not have bodied the role of carmen okay eartha just like and, and dorothy gave it to us too like dorothy gave us bad girl she gave us sexy she gave us deep she gave it to us now i'm not taking away from her but eartha like eartha literally the role of carmen was literally built for for like eartha like it really was um and then also, uh, you know, Dorothy's voice was dubbed by an opera singer because, I mean, even though Dorothy had pipes, she didn't have, like, opera singer pipes. And if it had went to Joyce, even though Joyce wasn't trained for opera or anything, Joyce had a very, like, operatic voice sometimes. And I feel like, Do like Joyce would have, like, killed the singing parts. I don't know how she would have played the role, but she would have bodied the singing parts. And did y'all remember reading, I don't know if anybody ever read this, but James Baldwin actually did a write-up back in the day, back in the 50s when this movie came out, where he was saying like, 
you know, Pearl Bailey should have had played the part of Carmen because Pearl Bailey is a better actress. And, you know, no shade, no tea, but I agree with him. Like, Pearl Bailey is a better actress. But he was talking about how because of colorism and, you know, Pearl is not like the slender, you know, because Pearl is not, she's not, a, she was not fat or anything, but she was definitely not like that slender, shapely type of slinky idea and because she was more of a darker skinned girl they would have never given that part to her i don't know dorothy bodied the role but honey i can't help but think that eartha of everybody eartha would have killed it and then i would have been very curious to see what joyce did with it but that's a little side note sorry i had to go on a little tangent let me uh let me let me move forward <laughs> Joyce's profile was getting so high that Hollywood directors were actually talking of making a film built around the songstress's singing abilities. And even her booking agent urged her to take a lead role in a film that was being produced in this time period. Bryant was also featured in the film Porgy and Bess. Her schedule was hectic and demanding, and to keep up with it, Brian began abusing pills like many of her peers of the day to make it through the never-ending work weeks, developing a dangerous addiction. She also had drug problems. It's true. During those days, you have to take sleeping pills. I had needed to take sleeping pills to go to sleep, and I guess um, up downers to go to bed, and uppers to wake up or what have you. Not only that, but the singer's signature locks were starting to become damaged from the dye. After a particularly bad dye job, she ended up having to resort to wearing wigs. Since she no longer needed the gimmick of the silver hair anyway, she quickly dropped the platinum tresses. But that was just one of many problems that would face the Chanteuse. Joyce was constantly weary of the company around her. The club owners, often gangsters and other shady characters, were always lusting after her body, hitting on her, and making her uncomfortable. She also feared for her safety, thinking that the men were trying to drug her. In fact, there's a story by Bryant herself where she says that when she was sitting at a dinner table, I think she was like either at some kind of party or something, or it was like after one of her performances, one of these men actually tried to stick a needle of something into her arm, and she had to get away from them just as quick as she could like it was crazy stuff going on around her often these men couldn't separate bryant's sultry stage persona from her actual personality which was considerably more conservative in fact she frequently turned down dates she didn't drink she didn't smoke she didn't do drugs and she constantly faced sexual harassment and abuse they didn't think about the person inside i was a sex Never. symbol and as far as they were concerned i was sleeping every trip my every little every ladder every rung of the ladder I slept my way up this is as far as they're concerned they had no idea what kind of person I was and didn't want to know am. no but you see whatever sex I exuded and I think uh, I used to have men come and beat the door the dressing room doors down I mean and and look at me thinking I was ready to just <laughs> right then and there and I'm wondering what's going on with what's happening I didn't know that I exuded that kind of thing or that kind of sensuality I didn't realize you what didn't it was try then. it was and there. I didn't try you didn't try it was so just there. there whatever happened in their mind and then also another thing living up to that image I mean, seriously I hate to say in bed living up to that image people have this oh sexy this whatever it is oh that's I mean, a pressure this fantasy that they oh. have seriously right. And That's so they want you to move that right in to bed. Well, I always said or that everybody, you know. everybody always adored me, but nobody loved me. There. When they True. found yeah. out, you know, say, that I was just a basic human being yeah. and that I brushed my teeth and did other ne uh, necessary nobody things. Nobody wants to know so. that. All of this came to a head when one night after refusing a man's advances, she was physically assaulted in her dressing room. Of course, being a black woman, I was going to say in those times, but really in any time, people place the blame in the wrong place. And some of her fans soured against her sexy image because of this incident. And as if that wasn't bad enough, Joyce's most prized possession, her voice, was also beginning to suffer. The constant strain on her vocal cords left her with an injury that left her unable to perform. One night, Joyce overheard her management discussing a treatment with the doctors for how to treat her voice fast enough for her to be able to perform that night. The doctors suggested that they lace her throat with cocaine. They said that she would be able to perform as the cocaine would numb the pain, but it was likely that she would develop an addiction. 
To which her manager literally said, I don't care what you do, just make her sing. Disgusted, Joyce had had enough. She marched in and immediately told her management, I quit. Show business, said Lena Horn in 1973. I suppose she'd say it today. Mm -hmm. Show business is a rotten profession for a black woman. It's filled with spoilers and takers. You have to hold on by your fingernails. Someone really has to be in your corner to survive. Someone solely for you. Yes, it's true. I believe that. I, I really believe that. Joyce Bryant walked away from the height of her career in 1955 at 28 years old. Wounded from her time in mainstream entertainment, Joyce jumped headfirst into her religion by enrolling in a seven-day Adventist college and becoming a missionary. And even though she was sometimes unwelcome or judged by certain members of her church for her former career as a singer, Bryant claimed that God saved her life. Joyce was finally at peace with her life and her decision to leave show business. Over the course of the 60s, the singer would find herself in financial woes thanks to unscrupulous management stealing her money, and she would also have trouble with her taxes. But Joyce never lost her fight, her spirit, her faith, or her love for music. She obtained vocal lessons to become classically trained and returned to music by singing opera. Even in a completely different genre, Bryant still dominated, performing with the Watergate Symphony in Washington, D.C., the New York City Center Opera Company, and various European opera companies. Once the 80s rolled around, Bryant reprised her old act of singing her classic pop tunes on stages, but this time it was on her own terms. No sexy image, no slinky gowns, no silver hair, no pomp and circumstance. Just a lady and her talent. Joyce herself also became a vocal coach in the 80s training some of the most talented voices in music such as Phyllis Hyman and Jennifer Holliday. If you're wondering why a documentary or movie hasn't been made on this absolute icon yet, get in line because honestly attempts have been made. However, according to Joyce and her family, they're seemingly blocked at every turn with videos, interviews, and performances being taken down. Both Bryant and her niece strongly believe that the Illuminati does not want Joyce's story to be told. And despite how I might feel about that personally, I will say that it's very odd. Even though, like I said, I have my own beliefs about the Illuminati and I don't think they line up with Joyce and her, her and her families. But look, I'm telling y'all, there were interviews, there were pictures that I have found back in the day. I always knew I wanted to do a video on Joyce Bryant. And I have known about these videos and these pictures and all this good stuff for at least a couple of years now. And it's just weird to me that they keep disappearing off the internet. Like, I can't find some of these things anywhere. It's really crazy how hard they are to find and how they've literally been scrubbed from the web despite the fact that they were available, like, just a year ago. Anyway, that's a part of the reason why I decided to include so many clips of Joyce speaking and singing in this video so that, you know, one, we kind of have a place for the bit of existing content of Joyce um, to sort of reside. And also because I want people to hear this still living legend tell her story in part in her own words. After all, hearing anything straight from the source will always be better than any retelling or recount could ever be. And who knows, like, maybe this will inspire the next generation of filmmakers, hint hint, to jump on this and tell this story. I mean, Coco Jones is sitting over here with nothing better to do than the damn Bel Air reboot. So let's give Coco Jones um, something. Let's give Normani something. To, what is Normani doing? Let's give Normani something to do in between the five years it takes to, to make her next album. Anywho. With that being said, the lovely Miss Bryant is still alive and well with us today at 95 years old and is currently being cared for by her niece. She's even on Instagram under Joyce Bryant Official, a page that is ran by her niece. And um, it seems like they really love to respond to fans and questions and yeah, they really appreciate stuff like that. So while this woman is still living to smell them, let's go ahead and give her her flowers. <laughs> 